Hey, can we get some excitement? There we go. That's better. I like it. Hey! I like that. Well, welcome. How's everybody week? Great? Very good? Sitting in heavenly places? I can tell by your faces. That's good. Well, welcome. Why is tonight so special? It's Shabbat. Praise the Lord. It is Shabbat. Praise the Lord. Yes, Shabbat Shalom. Welcome. This is Mishkan David, which is Hebrew for Tabernacle of David. My name is Thomas Orms Jr., a.k.a. T Squared, as dubbed by our wonderful Revitson many moons ago when I was a little peanut walking around. And it stuck. I don't know. I can't get rid of the nickname. That's it. But yes, welcome. If you're new here or new tuning in online, it is Shabbat and it is a wonderful time to gather and to be together and to worship our God and our King and to be able to just come in and ah, to rest. Yes. And if you've never celebrated the Shabbat before, there's going to be seven reasons as to why it should be important to you on the screen behind me very, very soon. Reason number one, the Lord told us to do it. That should be the most important reason. Number two, whether you're a Jew or you're a Gentile, our Messiah, he kept the Shabbat. Every hero of the Bible that you've read about, they kept the Shabbat. And we are here gathered together finally in one accord, in agreement that Jesus was Jewish. <gasps> oh my goodness. I can't believe it. It was a Jewish book written by Jewish people about a Jewish Messiah. Wow. We are now one in his hand, Jew and Gentile together, just like the desire of King David's heart. He said that his house of worship would be a house of worship for all nations. If you look around, we have people from every background, every, uh, you know, institution. We have all come together in agreement, finally, one in his hand, as it says in our website, where God's house is no longer divided. We have come agreement that we will lift up the son of Elohim, Messiah Yeshua, that he will be our main focus no matter what. And if he lifted up, he is lifted up, he will draw every man to himself. And that is what Mishkan David is about. Behind me is the elements, the candle, the bread, the wine. And um, it's a beautiful thing to learn about our Messiah, whether a Jew or a Gentile, we have to go to the same exact place to learn about him. And that is the first part of your Bible, that first half, known as the Old Testament. When in reality it's the Torah and then the Tanakh, the first five books of your Bible, which every word that came out of our Messiah's mouth can only be found in the first half of our Bible. So we're going to go there to learn about him, who he was, what he was about, the prophecies fulfilled as a Jew, very special place for me, and as a Gentile learning the roots of your faith, coming back to the first love which is the Hebrew roots of our faith. And so the first place we're going to go is a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, which has to do with the lighting of the candles. Okay, this is a tradition that has been passed down through the people of Israel for several thousands of years. Uh, it can be found its roots in the ministering of the Levitical priesthood in the tabernacle of the wilderness, how they would maintain the candles. But the most important thing is that it's a representation of the light. It was the mother's job, the woman's job, to light the candles in the home, to keep the house lit, to keep the house warm for the family. And it was the first sign of our Messiah and His coming, one of the first prophecies that can be found in Isaiah. There are several prophecies in Isaiah. There are many prophecies before the book of Isaiah, many prophecies after. But it says here in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, Therefore... The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Im 
Anuel, direct translation from Hebrew to English is with us, God, but we have transliterated and we say now God is with us. And this is the first sign that our Messiah was a human being. You've heard Rabbi Gabe uh, quote the verses in John many times that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh to condemn sin in the flesh. A lot of people try to take away the humanity of Messiah Yeshua because you've heard Rabbi Gabe say before, if we were cucarachas, he would have came as a cucaracha. If we were caballos, Spanish for horse, he would have came as a horse. But we are all created as human beings in his image. And so he had to come as a human being to show us, as it says in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17, that he didn't come to condemn, to break the law. He came, the Hebrew word for fulfillment is lechayem, which actually the true translation is to establish. He came as a human being to establish the law of God, to show us how to walk in his righteousness. And that first sign was him being born of a woman as a human being, just like the rest of it. Raise your hand if you came out of your mother. Okay, just checking. So if you would please stand, my beautiful bride is going to come and uh, lead us in this prayer, lighting the candles as Messiah Yeshua declared himself to be the light of the world. And the word of God says that he is the light that lights every man. So the light of the world came through a woman. The first, one of the first prophecies beautifully and wonderfully given to us by our Lord to signify who our Messiah is. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe. You have sanctified us by your word, given us Yeshua, our Messiah, and commanded us to be a light to the world. Amen. Ohar Alam, the light of the world. Now in my hands here is beautiful challah, and uh, the reason why this even is significant is now, you know, by the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, we were able to interpret everything spiritually. The Lord wants us to ask Him about everything, and He can be in everything if you look for Him. And so... My favorite story when I first started attending the Mishkan, because obviously as a Jew, I've been eating challah my whole life. I just knew it as a tasty bread. Other than that, it didn't mean anything to me. But the first time I heard Rabbi Gabe tell the story about he was watching his wife uh, create, make a challah in the kitchen from scratch. And the traditional uh, Jewish recipe is three pieces of dough being braided into one loaf. And in that moment, as Rabbi Gabe was looking on and observing this, the Lord told him, that is a direct representation of who I am, even in the bread. Because there's a very special word in Hebrew. It's echad, which the translation is one, but it infers a compound unity. That's the beautiful thing about Hebrew is that every Hebrew word is not only represented by a symbol, it is also represented by a picture and a number. It is one of the most complex languages where there is always something to discover, which is why it's amazing that it is the heavenly language, the language that our Messiah has spoken. So that word, echad, is a compound unity showing us through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh that it is three in one. It has always been the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we like to say triunity here at Mishkan because there are a lot of Trinitarian doctrines out there that like to completely separate Father from Son and Holy Spirit. But we know that they are three entities that operate independently, but they are one. As it says in Genesis chapter 26, let us make man in our image. The Lord is talking in third person. 
right? Our and inclusion. And so even in our bread, we have something beautiful there. And the prophecy that we're going to go to can be found in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. And the reason why this is important is because just like in the U.S., the national sport is basketball and football, well, the national sport for Israel and for Jewish people is arguing. We're very good at it. We've done it for a long time. Don't ask us if we have an opinion, because guess what? We have an opinion. And so, the Lord, knowing that and knowing our hearts, he had to give us very direct words. And this is a road map to where our Messiah would be born, a prophecy telling us exactly where he will be born, so there will be no room for argument. And it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now the reason why this is important, because the word Bethlehem in English doesn't mean anything. But in Hebrew, it is actually two Hebrew words. The word bet or bait, which means house, and the word lechem, which means bread. And so Messiah Yeshua declared himself to be the bread from heaven. There are several references to him being the bread. And he was born in a town called the house of bread. So the bread from heaven born in a Jewish small little town called the house of bread. And it's so beautiful that we've been able to realize that. And the rabbinical community, they like to argue that verse and say, well, no, that's about King David. Well, I'm sorry to tell you it's impossible that it could be about King David because, number one, it was a prophetic text. And by the time that that text was written, our beloved King David was in the ground. So you don't write a prophecy about someone who's already dead. Okay, that's just not how it works. Okay, and secondly, you read it says, From old and from everlasting, Messiah Yeshua was the one who conquered death. King David did not rise again from the dead. He stayed dead. Obviously, we know his soul is in heaven with the Lord, and we'll all meet him one day, but he did not conquer death. He was not an everlasting being. So we know that that prophecy, that text is exactly about our Messiah, Yeshua, and who he was. Now, in our hands here, we have the matzah. If you haven't got a chance, the elements are there uh, right in front of the sound booth. There's the wine on the right, because there's always the right choice to make. That's my favorite joke that I came up with for myself. And um, But yes, we have the matzah here. If you have a big enough piece, there's tiny little holes and brown stripes going down. And this is a representation, again, of our Messiah. That night, the Last Supper, he broke a piece of bread and he told his Talmudim, his disciples, this is my body broken for you. And of course, as you know, Messiah Yeshua, he loved to speak about future events. He always gave it to you straight, but he didn't always give you the exact information about what was going to happen. He left interpretation for the Holy Spirit. And so he was talking about what was going to happen to him as he passed around that piece of bread. This is my body broken for you, he says. And we know that later that night he was arrested and he chose to be arrested. You've heard Rabbi Gabe quoted before. He says it himself that he could have asked the Lord to send many legions of angels. I don't remember the number, but more than count that they wouldn't be able to touch him if he didn't want to be arrested. So he allowed himself to be arrested and then he was beaten severely. He was then whipped by a Roman lash known as the scorpion, which was one of the worst torture devices ever invented of all time, which is where we get the saying in Isaiah, by his stripes we are healed. Forty times he was ripped, and that flesh was ripped off his back down to the bone because there are pieces of metal, glass, other bone shards from other human beings. Okay, Forty times, imagine. And then a crown of thorns was shoved under the top of his head. The end had to carry a cross until physically as a human being he ran out of energy and they had to get someone from the crowd to carry it for him and finally he was crucified on that cross the worst death at that time he was the most innocent person given the most horrible death at that time invented by the Roman Empire and so in that moment when he died for us we know that he took the punishment for us I'm glad that the Bible paints a gruesome picture of what happened to him because 
That is the, ra- the reality, the gravity of what happened, how horrible it was, was him showing his love for us. And if he was willing to take that punishment, we no longer have to take that punishment. Thank God. But more importantly, we don't punish other people or allow ourselves to be in situations to where we are punished. And so every week, we thank him for taking that punishment, realizing truly what he went through on our behalf. And we say, Bauchata Donai Eloheinu Malecha Olam, Chamotzi Lechem Min Haaretz. Amen. In English, Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who wishes forth bread from the earth. Amen. And let us never forget that Yeshua, our Messiah, is the true bread from heaven that a man may eat thereof and never taste death. Please partake in his body. Now the next prayer, the blessing over the yain or the wine, perhaps even more significant than the blessing over the bread. We know that it is a representation of blood. And the concept of blood or a price being paid is not a New Testament concept. It was done by the Lord all the way in the beginning. In Bereshit, in Genesis, when Adam and Eve committed the first sin, they broke the first commandment by God given unto men, which was to not eat of that tree. And whether he said she did it and she blamed the devil and what matters is they did it. They made the choice. Okay? And what did they do? The moment they realized they sinned, they were ashamed. They hid themselves in the bushel. And the Lord did something very special. He didn't have to. But he went out into that garden knowing everything, knowing exactly where they were, what they had done. He called them by name. Because from the beginning, he wanted to show us that he is always giving us a choice to reveal ourselves to him and to come to him willingly. So finally, thank God, they revealed themselves from that bush. And it doesn't say that out of his mouth he said, I forgive you, Adam and Eve. But it does say what he did. Because words are always just service. Actions speak louder than words. The Lord cares about how you act, not how your lips are moving. And so he slayed an animal on their behalf. It doesn't say what kind of animal it is. I'd like to think it was a lamb. But he slayed an animal to cover their sin, to cover their shame, to pay that price of what they did. Then you fast forward to the tabernacle in the wilderness in Exodus, the sacrificial system, which every person was prorated based on what they had done. If you had plenty, you would give an ox. If you had not as much, you would give a lamb or a goat and then to a dove. And then if you didn't even have that, you would give a a grain offering with oil. But again, a price was being paid. And the text says that the sacrificial system was invented to purge the conscience of the children of Israel for the same exact reason, to eliminate their shame so that they can continue with their relationship with him. And then finally in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, if you are a new covenant believer, if you are accepted Messiah Yeshua into your heart and you have a relationship with God, you need to memorize those four verses. That is the first written account of the New Testament, the new covenant in the Bible given to us. And it says that, Oh, the covenant they break, although he was a husband unto them. Meaning that at that time, the Lord was as close to us as possible, even in the old covenant. So they like to say that he was a faraway God in the old covenant, that he was a God of judgment and wrath. Well, remember that it was over 700 years before he committed judgment unto Israel. But because he always keeps his promises, instead of destroying them, He said, no, I'm going to remember my promise to Abraham that I established, and I'm going to make a new covenant. And finally, he sent that perfect sacrifice, that one sacrifice for all time, past, present, and future sins, his only begotten son that died on our behalf so that we could continue our relationship with him. It is not a license to continue sinning. 
It is a license to continue the pursuit of your relationship. And it is very serious what he has done for us. And so every single week we are reminded and we thank him for giving us that opportunity. We thank him for eliminating our shame. And we say, Amen. In English, blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. As King David said, come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see, please. If he is good, say amen. Now, everything here that was presented on the table is everything that he did for us, nothing we did. And if you're savvy enough, you might think, well, that is the gospel. Yes, this is the good news. And the Lord has formulated this in a very specific way because it is Shabbat. And most institutions of worship, they do what's called an altar call at the end of their service, where after the worship and after the message, hopefully your heart is convicted enough that you want to establish your relationship with the Lord. But because it is Shabbat, the Lord has formulated that we do this at the beginning of our service. Because unfortunately, the Word of God says that there is no rest, there is no Shabbat for the wicked. But the Word of God also says that He gives His beloved rest, Shabbat, and peace, Shalom. And so we invite you at the beginning of Shabbat every week to establish your relationship with Him because Shabbat is step one. If you cannot master the Shabbat, I love you, but you cannot call yourself a spiritual person. Because if you can't stop for 24 hours and dedicate just one full day to God, then how can you learn to do that for the rest of the week, for the rest of your life? You have to be able to master the one day first. And so we invite you to establish your relationship with the God at the beginning of every Shabbat, and it's not a, a show. We don't ask you to raise your hand. You don't have to come to the front. That's something between you and the Lord. You can do that on your own. But please, we want you to experience what many of us here are experiencing, the, the amazing opportunity that we have to rest and establish our relationship with Him. And how we do that is this next prayer here on the screen called the Shema. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 through 40, our rabbi was asked a question by a lawyer, a studier of the law, tempting him, trying to mess him up, which usually doesn't go well. I myself know that I have tried to trip the Lord up many times, and I lose every time, I promise you. But they said, Master, or rabbi, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verses 4 and 5 saying, Shema Israel, hear O Israel, which the word Shema itself, again in Hebrew, another hidden meaning of the word, it doesn't just mean hear, it means hear and do. When you say Shema, it's not just about hearing the word, it's about also being a doer of the word. So Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might says the Old Covenant. Messiah Yeshua added perhaps the most important factor of the Shema in the New Covenant. He said, all of your mind. Because we know now, like it says in Jeremiah chapter 31, that the law of God is written on our hearts and on our minds. The kingdom of heaven is within us now. We are the walking tabernacles of the Holy Spirit. When you accepted him into your heart, he moved inside of you. And so, Rav Shaul, Rabbi Paul, said you are transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to change the way you think. and You have to give all of your mind to God. If you've heard Rabbi Gabe say, he asked for 100% of your heart, 100% of your soul, 100% of your mind, not 10% of your wallet. So if you want to walk in power, if you want to be healed, if you want to be restored, if you want to be like Messiah Yeshua, if you want to be like every famous person out of the Bible, if you want to be like his disciples, you have to start here with this prayer. This is number one commandment. It is the most important thing because he said, this is where we start. So please join me. And we say, 
Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevot, Malchuto Leolam Vaed. In English, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever and ever. Please give him a round of applause. <clears throat> now that we have established our relationship with God, like myself many years ago, yes, there is another prayer on the screen, and then there's another prayer after that, and I was like, oh, my God. There's too many prayers, man. This place is weird. This guy is weird. This lady is weird. I don't like this stuff, man. But guess what? I wasn't trying to be a spiritual person. I wasn't trying to think with the Shabbatnik brain, which is to see the spirituality in everything. And this first prayer is known as the Kiddush prayer, honoring the God of creation, thanking him for what he has done for us. And we don't have the time, but you can find a direct quotation of it in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. I encourage you to read it on your own. It says that not only we're commanded to rest, but we are commanded to remember that the Lord took us out of Egypt. We have all been liberated from our own personal Egypts. We were slaves to sin in our past, but now we are free in Messiah Yeshua. And so every single week we thank the Lord, always remembering, not taking for granted, which I have been guilty of many times. But thank God every week I'm reminded with this prayer not to take him for granted. And we say, Ba'ucha ta Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidishanu b'mitzvotav ratzavanu, v'shbat kodesho b'ahav ratzon hin hilanu, zikaon l'maseh v'reshit, ki hiyon te hilan mekhe kodesh, zekhe l'etziat misraim, ki vano v'charta v'otanu kidishta mekol hamim, v'shbat kodeshecha b'ahav ratzon hin haltanu, Ba'ucha ta Adonai, mekadesh shabbat, Amen, in English. <clears throat> Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and wanted us to be his own. And with love and favor, he gave us his holy Sabbath as a heritage, a remembrance of creation. For that day is the prologue to the holy convocation, a memorial of the exodus from Egypt. For us did you choose and us did you sanctify from all the nations. And your holy Sabbath, with love and favor, did you give us as a heritage. Blessed are you, O Lord, who sanctifies the Sabbath. Amen. Now, this next prayer is the Rafua, the prayer for health and healing. The most powerful prayer in my personal life, attending this place. Six years ago, I came to this building sick in every single human capacity, which was mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. I had only two choices left for my life. Either death by suicide or going to jail because of the choices that I had made. And when I first started plugging into the Shabbat program, I was only given one instant healing by the Lord. It doesn't happen always like we see on TV. And I asked the Lord and I was wondering, I was like, Lord, I'm doing the Shema. I'm establishing your relationship with you. I'm plugging into the Shabbat program. Why am I still sick? He said, go talk to Rabbi Gabe. I said, dang it. I go talk to Rabbi Gabe. We all love him because he is a straight shooter. In love, he will give it to you like it is. So I said, Rab, I said, I've been doing this for a little while now. Why am I still in certain areas sick? Why am I still under, you know, physical pain? Why is my mind not, not fully restored? And he told me, well, you haven't fully given your heart to God. I was like, ouch, man. I said, but I'm saved already. He says, no, it's not about being saved. It's about being sanctified. Salvation is step one. It is progressive. When Messiah Yeshua said it is finished, it meant that he was done and it is now our turn. And so I asked Rabbi, I was like, well, what the heck do I do then? And he goes, I encourage you to pray the same prayer I prayed, which was, Lord, invade every deep darkness of my heart and shine it with your light. The moment I did that, every single week, reciting the Rafua and praying that prayer, the Lord showed me that I was messed up inside, man. I had a lot of malice, unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, blaming of other people, pride. 
still do a little bit. But I started allowing the Lord to take those things from me, giving it up to him. Forgiving people was the hugest tool that I was given coming to this place. Releasing is what gets the healing, nothing else. So please join me in that prayer. And we say, Heal us, O Lord, and we shall be healed. Save us, and we shall be saved. For you are our praise. And bring complete recovery for our ailments. May it be your will, O Lord my God, and the God of my forefathers that you quickly send a complete recovery from heaven, spiritual healing and physical healing. For you are God, King, the faithful and compassionate healer. Blessed are you, O Lord, who heals the sick of his people, Israel. Now our wonderful Revitzen and Canner is going to lead us in worship. As you've heard her say before, the Lord inhabits the praise of his people. We have much to be thankful for. We have much to praise him for. Shabbat shalom. Thank you, T. And as we get ready to enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise, we're going to start off with, of course, the very distinctive sound, the sound of the shofar, sound that we're going to become very familiar with, especially the next few days. This, this sound figures prominently in, uh, in, in worship, in our worship, or should, because it is the sound that is going to announce the fact that the Lord has returned and the moment when every eye will see him. But it is also the this, this call to worship and a call to peace. And the Shabbat is all about the Lord. It's a sound that should remind us that this 24-hour period, this particular 24-hour period, is sanctified. It was blessed. I was speaking to someone when, uh, not too long ago that, um, um, that was a regular Sunday worshiper and was, took her worship very seriously, still does, but she decided to, to worship on the Shabbat and she actually said, you know, it's different. It doesn't feel the same. That's because that's intentional. The Lord, the scripture says the Lord blessed this day. He sanctified it. He made it holy. So if you worship on the day he says to worship, you bet it's going to feel different than any other day. And that's what the sound of the shofar is a reminder of that, is a reminder that God is not just a part of our life. He is our life. And it's also a reminder that um, Messiah Yeshua should be the name we call, the name above every name. We need to call upon his name and, um, and remember that without him, there is no Shabbat Shalom because he is the Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, as we listen to that call to worship and the call to peace. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who separates the holy from the profane. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who grants us a Shabbat of rest, 
a time of fellowshipping with you and fellowshipping with one another. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who fulfilled his promise and sent the Messiah, whom the sages said that when Messiah would come, he would teach us how to walk the Torah, how to live the Torah. And Messiah Yeshua did just that. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, because Messiah Yeshua taught us that true righteousness begins in the heart, who said that if you clean the inside of the cup first, the outside would be cleansed as well. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who will send the Messiah again very soon to take his rightful place on the throne of David in Jerusalem. And at long last, establishing your will here on earth as it is in heaven, your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And at long last, we will, the world will enjoy true peace on earth and goodwill to all men. As we enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise, we remember the words of the prophet Isaiah who said, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. We praise you and we thank you, Lord, on this last Shabbat before Yom Teruah, before Rosh Hashanah. We praise you and we thank you. We enter into your courts with thanksgiving and with praise.
my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. I praise you and I thank you, Lord. You are God and we praise you and we acclaim you. All creation worships you, Lord, and so do we.
Now, my God, I pray, let your eyes be open and let your ears be attentive to the prayer made in this place. Now, therefore, arise, O Lord God, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation and let your saints rejoice in goodness. O Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Remember the mercies of your servant David. Arise, heaven and earth shall pass away, but the word of the Lord shall stand forever.
Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Shalom, help somebody feel really, really welcome here and um, just share a word of encouragement or, or just a smile. Straight. 
to praise the Lord. Thank you, honey. Can you shut that fan off, please? Thank you. Thank you, honey. Thank you, dancers. And uh, anyone happy to be in the house of the Lord besides myself? Amen. What did Yeshua say in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20? Where two or three are gathered in his name, Religion shows up. Just checking to see if we're reading the same Bible. He said, there am I in the midst of them. Are we gathered in his name? Can we say his name in Hebrew? Yeshua. Where two or three are gathered in his name, Yeshua. Yeshua in Hebrew means salvation. That's why Paul wrote, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be what the name of the Lord means. Aren't you glad you called upon the name of the Lord? 
Is that the best decision you and I ever made? Is that the best decision? Best decision. Calling on the name of the Lord. And uh, awesome, awesome. And uh, glad to be here. Glad for our brothers and sisters watching live on the internet. Um, and, uh, and the Lord is here. If you don't have a close encounter with God tonight, it's not because He's not here, it's because you're not here. Because how I many know you could be physically present somewhere, but your mind could be a million miles away? And that's why the Lord, that's why the scripture says in Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3 that He will keep us, anyone, in perfect peace whose mind is stayed. Whose mind, what is God saying? Control your mind. Whose mind is stayed on thee. If you could keep your mind on God, you would have perfect peace. And notice that only perfect peace can be found in Him. When you look at here in the earth, what are you going to have? Tribulation. He said, in the earth, in the world, you will have tribulation. But when you keep your mind on God, you could be at perfect peace in a world that's filled with tribulation. Is that awesome or what? That's why the first and great commandment, I love what T said. Thanks for learning the stuff so I'm not just talking to just the chairs. That the first and great commandment that came out of the mouth of the Lord is that you, we love Him with all of our mind. And when you love God with all of your mind, you will have a sound mind. You will have a peaceful mind. In Yiddish, the word is called meshugana. You won't be a meshugana. You won't be, you won't have that crazy mind. I mean, if you focus on God, you could go from insanity to sanity. You could be transformed by the renewing of our minds. I mean, it is awesome. And it is a peace. King David said in his presence is fullness of joy. In his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So what is God commanding us? That we be in his presence. Is he interested in our joy? He wants us to be happy. Yes, he does. He's a good father. And of course, Rav Shaul, known as Paul in the Bible, said that it is a peace that surpasses all understanding. In other words, there is no peace, there is no shalom like the peace that we have in God. And once you start to discern that in your spirit, I'll say that again, that's a good one. Once you start to discern that in your spirit, your spirit will be seeking that. You'll be thirsty for God. That's what he said, blessed are those that hunger and thirst. You got to want it. Somebody say, you got to want it. And most people out there aren't going to encourage you to do that. And uh, I mean, it is awesome. When you want it, when you ask the Lord, he says, I, I, I answer. When you seek, you find. When you knock, he opens. Every time you reach out to God, he is there. And that means that he is the ever-present God. He's always there. And so if, you're, if you feel like you're far away from God that day, and you're born again to the Spirit of God, it's not because he left you. It's because you left him. Does that make sense? Somebody say, I want to have a great day. See God. He rewards those that diligently seek him. He rewards those that don't seek him also. It's just not good stuff. You will be rewarded. I've been, how many people say, I've been on both sides of that fence. I like the reward of, of seeking him better than the reward of running away from him. Much better. Anyway, we're in a place called Mishkan David, the tabernacle of David. David was king over Israel. He was a righteous king. Israel, the nation of Israel, enjoyed some of her most blessed time. And uh, so we're going to read a psalm from King David. Is that all right? Keeping with the name of our congregation. And so we're going to read Psalm 61, is what the Holy Spirit put in my heart. And we're, we'll read the psalm and then we'll pray. And then we'll talk about the star of the Bible. Yeshua. The bright and morning star. Psalm 61. Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee or you. When my heart is over, overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me 
and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those that fear your name. You will prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. He shall abide, therefore, he shall abide before God forever. O oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. So will I sing praise unto your name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. Amen. Holy Spirit saying, you've made some promises to God. When you do, he hears them. Keep them, because he's a covenant-keeping God. He makes a promise, it's yes and amen. We make a promise and it's mm, maybe. Let's continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you here tonight. We call upon you in the name above every name, the name Yeshua, Hamashiach. The world knows him as Jesus the Christ. Father God, we not ask for things, material things tonight. We're asking for your Holy Spirit that you would fill each and every one of us with your precious oil from your throne to your own Fill every vessel here tonight to overflowing, that we would be filled with your love, your joy, your peace, your shalom that surpasses all understanding. And Father God, we seek your face tonight. Let your light shine upon each and every one of us. Let your light invade every bit of darkness, every bit of oppression, every bit of depression, every sickness, and every disease. Invade every one of those things, Father, with your presence and Father God, we thank you and praise you that your word declares that you have given us power over all the power of the enemy to tread on them, not them tread on us. Father God, thank you for giving us power by the Holy Spirit to tread on them as scorpions and serpents and that your word says that nothing by any means shall hurt us. We take authority here tonight in the name of Yeshua, commanding every unclean spirit, breaking every assignment of the enemy against us, against our families, against the congregation of the living God is commanded out of this place and broken in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Father God, we rejoice in our, in our Savior tonight, in our Messiah, in our names written in heaven. Father God, your spirit, bearing witness with our spirit that we are your sons and your daughters. And as we rejoice here tonight, our hearts are heavy for family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors, even our enemies. Father God, we pray for them tonight that you would draw them to yourself as you have done for each and every one of us. Let them taste and see that you are good. Let their names be written in heaven in the name of Yeshua. And as we look around this room and there are brothers and sisters, Father God, that you have called to be here, we lift them up to you, Lord, where, whatever their situation is, that you would touch them wherever they are, that you would set the captives free, restore them physically, spiritually, open doors, if they had to work, Lord, that they would be able to keep your Shabbat, that they would be able to congregate in the name of Yeshua. We pray for every one of these individuals. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters watching on the internet. Fill them, fill us with your knowledge, with your wisdom, with your truth. Set the captives free in the name of Yeshua. And Father God, we thank you and praise you for every single thing that has happened in our lives to this very moment knowing, as your word declares, that all things work together for the good because we love you and because you have called us for your purpose. Father God in heaven, thank you for your purpose for each and every one of us here tonight to conform us into the image of your Son, our King, our Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In his name we pray tonight, the name Yeshua, Hamashiach. The world again knows him as Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray and the people of God said, Amen, amen. Just a quick announcement. This Monday night, this Monday night is the Feast of Trumpets. In Hebrew, Yom Teruah. It is known in the Jewish world as Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of the year. Interesting because the Bible, the, 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 the Messianic calendar or the, or the Hebrew calendar, it is the seventh month. And so people say, why are we celebrating New Year in the seventh month? just like the world celebrates January 1st, New Year. Well, the seventh month is celebrated because even though the Bible in Exodus chapter 12 says when they came out of Egypt was the beginning of months, 
what happened to them subsequent to Egypt is the, what is called the Babylonian captivity. So Israel went into captivity because of their disobedience. No one's ever experienced captivity here because of our disobedience. You can't say amen, say oh me. They, they had what is called the Babylonian captivity. And they were captive in Babylon after Egypt for 70 years. And when they came out of Babylon was Rosh Hashanah. If you read it in Nehemiah chapter 8, that's when they began to read the Torah again. That's why the Torah cycle begins and ends right after Rosh Hashanah, in case inquiring minds wanted to know. Because some of you were asking, why, why is the Torah cycle? We are finishing the Torah cycle now, and we are beginning the Torah cycle. We have, we have these beautiful calendars. We get them from MessianicJewish.net. If you come to the Mishkan, you may be able to get one of these in person at a discount. Hopefully tomorrow we'll have some here for you. And uh, if you show up, you'll be rewarded. If you don't show up, you'll have to buy them online and pay extra. But in the, don't worry. If you're watching on the internet and you don't live here, MessianicJewish.net, you can order your own. And if you're here at the Mishkan tomorrow, hopefully we'll have enough to go around. And I do have some of them. I did order them. Praise God. The Holy Spirit reminded me. But if you have the last year's calendar, it's, it's good till the end of the year. So we're going to have a calendar available tomorrow that will last for the whole year. And, they, and, they, and it has all the Torah portion, uh, you know, the the Bible portions that we study on Saturday, and it has the Feast of the Lord. So, I mean, I recommend you have one of these. And if you don't have one of these, you can go to uh, Hebrew, the number four, Christians.com, and you will find the Torah portions and all of the Holy Days online. And uh, praise God, it's, um, as a Messianic congregation, we follow what are in Hebrew called Moadim, which means God's appointed times. In case you haven't noticed, all of the feast of the Lord are, 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 were, were or are being fulfilled by the Lord. Um, and so the, these are known as the fall feast. Monday night we're having a special service. We're going to blow the shofar. I'm going to blow the shofar. My new one. I've already been practicing. I'm, pray for me. Those things are not a. Those are not. That's not a real musical instrument, by the way. And uh, and so we're going to blow the shofar because it's God's appointed time. God said, "You blow the you blow the trumpet, you blow the shofar." Now, people that don't know the Lord may not know why do we blow the trumpet, but we as Messianic believers know that at the last Trump, not Donald Trump. At the, I was hoping that he would be the, the last trump. But Bible says the last trump. So at one of these feasts, of, one of these feasts will be the last time we blow the shofar before the return of the Lord. And so for us as Messianic believers, this is literally a dress rehearsal. And as I said, I hope you can be here Monday night at 7.30. Hopefully you can be here Tuesday also. Because God said that's a day of rest also. It's an extra Shabbat. What a mean God. He wants to take another day off. And it happens to be Labor Day Monday. I mean, it, it couldn't be better. So Monday night we're going to be here. Hopefully we'll see you at 7.30. We'll see you on the internet. And Tuesday morning will be 11 a.m. So it'll be like a Friday and a Saturday on a Monday and a Tuesday. What an awesome God. And we'll be back to my office until Wednesday. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But anyway... So we're going to celebrate, we're going to blow the shofar, and, uh, and we know that when the last trump is sounded, the king is coming. We know this from Matthew chapter 24, at the last trump it says, then he will show up. Somebody say, he's showing up, the king is coming. Is he coming? What happens if people don't believe it? Is that, is that going to stop him from coming? No, he's showing up whether you like it or not. Whether you believe it or you don't. Because when God says something, it's going to happen. Now, the tricky devil. Think about this. The Jewish people that don't have the Messiah, don't have Christ, 
They blow the shofar. They don't understand why they do it. There's no explanation. And if we can, and if we can be honest, most of Christianity doesn't know it either. Most of Christianity doesn't blow the shofar. Monday night and Tuesday is meaningless to them. And so the, the devil has literally, think about what the devil's done. He only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Yes, he stole your money, he stole your business, he stole your wife. That, that he does that for fun. <laughs> just, just for entertainment. But what did he really steal, if you think about it? He stole the Messiah, Christ, from most of the Jewish people. They don't believe in him. And he has stolen the holy roots of the faith to most Christians. And so the people blowing the shofar don't understand, and the people that don't blow the shofar don't understand either. But God in his wisdom, what a blessing. God has put together Jewish people with non-Jewish people in congregations like this, and he's giving us inside information. Shh. Come on, Rabbi Gabe, no one knows the day or hour. You know, this feast coming up, what a lot of people don't know is that this, the feast of Yom Teruah, the only way they knew exactly when it would be is when the stars would shine. At the last minute, they would know that that was, that was the day. They, they didn't know it in advance. That's the one holy day that they didn't know it until the last minute when it would come. And so, and we don't know which one. This could be the last one, but we know things need to happen. The Lord said, these are the things that are going to happen. Tomorrow's reading in the New Covenant, as part of the Torah reading and the, and, and the prophets, there's three chapters that, are, that we're going to read. Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. These are all the signs the Lord said of His coming. He even told us, these are the things that are going to happen before He comes. So we should know as believers the things. We're, we're listening to other prophets. We're listening to other people. How many know he is the prophet? How many know that's the best source of information for last days? Because you've got a lot of prophets today that are prophesying, if we can be honest, about the last days. And I hear a lot of stuff out there. The internet is a blessing and a curse at the same time. Because you've got all these prophets on there today. And oh boy, some of them give me a headache. But if you want accurate prophecy of the last days, what's going to happen? Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Read those three chapters. That is accurate information on the coming of the Lord. And, and, and we start in good. The Lord said, when you see these things, look up. Because your redemption draws near. What's going to be redeemed when the Lord comes? What's missing? You're born again. You have the Holy Spirit. You have eternal life. What, need, what do we need as born again believers? What needs to happen for, the, for, for, for us to be complete? The redemption of our bodies. Our physical bodies that are perishing are not, are, are not in line or, or in harmony with our soul. Because what did Paul say? The inner man is being renewed daily, but the outer man is perishing. In other words... I'm getting younger on the inside and older on the outside. I don't like that. If you're young, you can't understand that. But when you're older, you're like, I don't like this. And so what's missing? The redemption of our body. The Bible says, at the, at the blink of an eye, we will be changed, the Bible says, at the last trump. So we know when the shofar blows, one of these feasts will be the last one. And then he's coming. The king is coming. Now, as I was sitting there, I'm praying. I'm like, stuff's going through my mind. I've been praying all afternoon to see, what, Lord, what would you like me to say? And he, he warns us. The Holy Spirit put on my heart, Matthew 25, because we know he's coming. How many people believe the Lord is coming? And what's he going to find when he comes? There's going to be some people that are prepared, and there are going to be some people that are unprepared. And we have the parable of the ten virgins where he speaks and he says what's going to happen. And how, how many know that when he says something's going to happen? So go with me to Matthew 25. Notice beginning in verse 1 what Yeshua said. If you have a red question, who's speaking? He's speaking. What should we do when he speaks? He's the only one that cannot lie. He's telling us the truth. 100%. That's how I know the Bible is true because I try to disprove it. You can't because he's always telling the truth. 
Then shall the kingdom of heaven, Yeshua said, shall be likened unto ten virgins, which, notice what he says, took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. How many know Yeshua is known as the bridegroom? If he is the bridegroom, what does that make us? Sorry, gentlemen. The bride. The bride. That's why a good marriage is a good example, not just for the wife, for the husband. Because if you have a bride that's submitted to, your, to the husband, then you can see how you're supposed to be submitted to the Lord. Are you with me? I learned from my wife how to be a good wife to God. Or be submitted to God. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Thank you, honey. Husbands, love your wives as Christ, as Messiah, loved the church and gave himself for it. And we're supposed to be Messiah-like or Christ-like. We're supposed to be good brides as men. We're supposed to be submitted to God. A man who is not submitted to God is not a good husband. Yea or nay? We learn submission from our wives. At least I did. I don't know about you guys. Some of you guys are pretty dumb. Sorry. I told the Lord not to pick me because I said, I, I, you know, Lord, I, I, I tell it like it is. If you're looking for conduct, cotton candy preaching, this is not the place. If you're looking for that feel good message, how many know the truth will set you free? And the truth is not always cotton candy. So we'll read verse 1 again, Matthew 25. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. How many know people are waiting for the return of the Lord? Are we waiting for the return of the Lord? I am. And notice what he said in verse 2. Five of them were what? Five were wise. Five were foolish. If we were taking a percentage, that means that half, half the folks were wise and half were foolish. What was the problem, Lord? Now he explains it. They that were foolish, verse 3, took their lamps, and notice what he says, took no oil with them. Oh, they weren't saved. It doesn't say that. It says the ten were virgins. The ten were waiting for the bridegroom. I would say that's a believer, wouldn't you? We can say, no, that wasn't, that was, that wasn't a, a saved person. I say there's some saved people that are waiting for the Lord. And they're foolish. Why are they foolish? They took no oil with them. That's what the Lord said. Not me. Don't blame me. Don't get mad at me now. But the wise, verse 4, took oil in their vessels with their lamps Verse 5, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes. What is the blowing of the shofar, the feast of trumpet? What is that signal? The bridegroom comes. When's he going to come? At the last trump. Are we talking about last days? What, what's the Lord saying? There's going to be a group of people waiting for him. Five are going to be wise, five are going to be foolish. What's the difference between the two? Because if you understand this, hopefully you will not be in the latter category of a foolish person. How many know, how many know uh, uh, knowledge, knowledge is powerful? At least if you come to the Mishkan, you can't say you weren't warned. This is a dangerous place because you're going to hear stuff that you may not hear everywhere. And I'm not saying this to brag, I'm saying how sad, how sad that so many people out there are not going to be prepared. They're waiting for him, they know he's coming. And when he comes, it will be like a surprise. It'll be announced. That's what it says, right? At midnight, verse 6, Matthew 25, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes. Go out to meet him. 
Then Yeshua said in verse 7, all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out. In other words, at the last moment, when the shofar blows, when the announcement comes that the Messiah, the bridegroom comes, that's when the foolish virgins realize in other words, what, the, what is the Lord saying? It'll be too late. If you don't get this, now, when the last shofar blows, it's going to be too late, because then you're going to realize it when it's too late. At least if you come to the Mishkan, hopefully you're not going to have this problem. If you're watching on the internet, you're not going to have this problem. We're, we're not talking about us. We're talking about other people. No fools here. No fools watching on the internet. We understand these things. Because we talk about this on a regular basis. Go out to meet him. Verse 7, Then all those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. In other words, they were asking somebody else for oil. And you know what the Holy Spirit's showing me? A lot of Christianity today relies upon somebody else's anointing to pass on the anointing to you. Could you lay your hands on me for the anointing? Could you impart your anointing? How many of that's, that's a big no-no? Because that's what they're going to do at the last trump. They're going to say, give us of your oil. Give us of your anointing. Give us of your oil. Because that's where they were getting it from before. I remember as a young believer chasing ministries that I thought were anointed because they declared themselves anointed and I traveled far to get there to get some of the anointing until I realized the kingdom of God is within me. The anointing is within me. I stopped getting on buses, trains, and automobiles, looking for the anointing and trying to get it from somebody else. I pass from being a foolish virgin to being a wise virgin. Because what does the Bible say? The truth will set you free. I thought I had to get the anointing from somebody else. They had to lay hands on me to get the anointing. If you can't say amen, say oh me. I had to get it from them. Like they were the source. But the wise ones said no. The foolish said to the wise, verse 8, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered and saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go rather to them that sell and buy for yourself. Go get your own. And while they went to buy, verse 10, when they realized it, verse 10, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was, oh, there's going to be some virgins that are going to be crying. I mean, is this the Lord saying this? What a mean God. No, what a real God. In other words, if you did not buy your own oil, that means you qualify for what he said to, what he's going to say to many people. I never knew you. Depart from me, he's going to tell them. You work, we did all, we prophesied in your name. Oh, we got to go there. We got to go there. I think that's in Matthew 7. Verse 21. How I many know it's a serious business? Is this serious business? We're talking serious business. Because imagine, imagine you're waiting for the Lord. You're a believer. You believe in God. And now the call is made. The bridegroom's here and you're like, hey! And you're like, oh, I got no oil. Esther, give me some of your oil. And Esther's like, I've been playing music now for years. You're the, you were sitting back there texting your friends not paying attention, you weren't worshiping, you weren't, you weren't seeking your own oil, now you want some of my oil, the piano is it's just unplugged. I'm done. I don't know if she'll say that, but 
She might. You know my wife. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, verse 22, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? Did he just say many will say to me in that day? It says many. If, if, if we are probably the last generation, if you think about this, that means the many are going to say this are alive right now. Not understanding these things. My people perish. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6, what did God say, say to the nation of Israel? My people perish for lack of knowledge. A lot of people don't know this because they're going to try to justify their entrance to heaven by the things they did for God. And notice what it says here. Many will say to me in that day, many will say to me. In what day? In the day he comes back. Yea or nay? How many people believe he's coming? The king is coming? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? And in your name have cast out devils, and in your name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you work you that work iniquity. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, does. Somebody say, it's not just about hearing, it's about doing. I like what T-square said. Shema, the Hebrew word Shema is not just hear, it's hear and do. God didn't tell the nation of Israel commandments and things to do for they just to hear. He wanted them to do it. But anyway, go back to um, Matthew 25. Are we getting some here tonight? I'm scaring you into having your lamp filled with oil. How I many of the fear of the Lord, the fear of God, is the beginning? Because it, it says many are going to many are going to be in trouble, and they're probably alive right now. And if we understand these things, it won't be one of us, at least. And I pray for every brother and sister. I don't want anyone to perish. I don't want anyone to get caught without oil or unprepared when the Lord comes back. Because every year we blow the shofar, it's like for us, as Messianic believers, it's a dress rehearsal for the return of the Lord. I don't know if people realize that. That's why I'm encouraging you to at least be here or watch on the Internet. Blow the shofar. That word, are you ready? Are you doing what he said? Are you wise or are you foolish? Are you prepared, basically, is the message tonight. Are you prepared? Because one thing is to expect. We're all expecting. But are you prepared? Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Because a lot of people say, oh, I want, I want the Lord to come. If you're not prepared, it's going to be a bad day for you. It's not going to be a good day. Can you imagine all these people that are going to say to him, Lord, we did all these things, and he's going to say, depart from me? Or, or, or five, while they went, and, and went to buy, verse 10, when they realized the, the, the foolish version, realized, I need to buy this stuff. I need to buy my own. I can't get it from somebody else. I can't get it from a human being. I can't get it from my brothers and sisters. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And afterward came also the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say to you, I know you not. Same problem. You see the problem? Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. He's saying, Be warned, watch. Be ready. Don't be foolish. Now, the ones that were wise knew where to buy, where to get. A lot of people don't even realize that today there are people that are believers that, that are waiting for the return of the Lord. They don't know where to get the stuff. Somebody said, I, we want to know. Or if, if, you're, if you're a member of the Mishkan, you know. Come on now. If you don't know by now, you just, you just showed up today for the first time. Go with me to uh, John chapter 4. See if this makes sense now. 
John chapter 4, when he came to a city, verse 5, he came to a city of Samaria, which is called, it's actually Shechem, near to the parcel of ground that Yaakov, Jacob, gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Yeshua, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Yeshua said to her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of Samaria to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Yeshua answered and said to her, If you knew, if you knew, the gift of God and who it is that says to you, give me to drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you. You would have asked of me if you knew the gift. Does it, do you need money to buy oil? Absolutely not. You need to ask. If you knew the gift of God, is it a gift? Yes. Who it is says to you, give me to drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From when then you have this living water, or that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave the well and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? And Yeshua and said to her in verse 13, Whosoever drinks of this water, talking about physical water, shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him... The water that I shall give him shall be where? In him, in us, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. How many know he's talking about the Holy Spirit? Now the Holy Spirit's described as water, described as oil. Are you with me? So if I was to be a wise virgin, I would know where to go. The kingdom of God, the Lord said, is within you. It's his pleasure to give you the Holy Spirit. But if we can be honest, most of us are asking God for things. What, is, what, is, what, what, what things should we ask for? He said, don't even ask for things. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things. I mean, if we can be honest and we can be straight here, most of the popular churches today are asking for things totally backwards. They're going to stand there saying, we did all these things. We did all these wonderful works for you. He's going to say, I never knew you. You're asking for stuff all the time. He said, don't even think about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, where you're going to live. Don't even think about that stuff. Life is more than these things. And either you're going to be foolish or you're going to be wise. Either you're going to understand these things and you will be prepared for the last trump or the last shofar or you won't. Either you will or you won't. Either you'll be in or you'll be out. God is serious. One thing he cannot do is lie. He's saying he's going to shut the door. Many are going to be upset. He's going to say to many, I, don't, I never knew you. If you knew, he said to the woman, if you knew the gift of God, look at verse 10 again. If you knew the gift of God, who it is that says to you, give me to drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you. And Yeshua answered and said to her in verse 13, whoever, whosoever drinks of this water shall thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. Thirst, but the water that I will give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to her, The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. And Yeshua said to her, Go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Yeshua said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. You mean divorce is not a New Testament? Is not a, is not a modern thing? How many know when you're going from one spouse to the next, that's a miserable life? That's not a happy lady. Five husbands? Some of us are on number two, number three. 
already looking for number four. I don't know. That means you're not happy. That means you're not fulfilled. That means you're not in the joy of the Lord. You're, you're looking for your happiness somewhere else. You're looking for the anointing from somebody else. And that's a common mistake. I'm not saying this to put anybody down. I'm saying this knowledge is powerful. Because imagine within yourself when you're born again is a well of water that when you ask, you receive. And when you ask, you're filled with life. And you're not looking to be some kind of, what's the word I want to use? Parasite? You're not looking to be a parasite of somebody else. That's a foolish person. It's available to each individual by knowing and asking and drawing. As I've said before, it's not running plumbing. And thank God for, for Esther, because she's here to lead people to worship, to enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise. Amen? I, I, I mean, I love the worship here. Not because she's my wife, because I love to worship God, and she happens to sing really well. I mean, I've heard some people sing, and it's like, it's like the gong show, you know? It's like some of these people in America who's got talent. Have you noticed some, um, some, not all of America has talent? So you've been married five times. You've had five husbands, verse 18. And he whom now you have is not your husband. In that you said truly. So you've been married five times, now you're living with a guy. And notice, now most churches, you'd be kicked out. You'd be condemned. He doesn't even mention that. I mean, he just told her, this is the story of your life. But he doesn't tell her you're, you're a serial <laughs> predator or something. <laughs> you can't be a member of this church. Honestly, if you, if you walked in, he said, I've been married five times, I'm living with a guy, I'd like to join your church. How many of the Lord doesn't look at the problem? He tells you the solution. We tend to look at the problem. You never, you never get delivered looking at the sin or looking at the problem. You get delivered looking at the truth. And to, and to get to the root of the problem. Because if you've been married five times, you're not a happy camper. And if you're living with somebody, you don't even trust to be married anymore. You just want to escape. The woman said to him, I perceive you're a prophet. No kidding. He just told her a whole life story. Verse 19. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Yeshua said to her, Woman, verse 21, Believe me, the hour comes when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the church. The Pope. This is not a church-friendly verse. How many, how many know much of the church is anti-Jewish? No Jews, no Jesus. Salvation is Yeshua came from the Jewish people. Salvation is of the Jews, but the hour comes and now is when the true worshipers, the hour comes now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. What's, tr what's a true worshiper of God? In spirit? When you're in spirit, where are you? You're within yourself. You're in the spirit. Where's the well? Where do we draw from? In the spirit. Not from somebody else. Somebody say it's simple, but it, it, a lot of people don't understand this. And truth, for the Father seeks such to worship in verse 23. Notice what Yeshua said in verse 24. God is spirit or is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit 
And in truth, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, which is called Christ, or Christos in Greek, that means Messiah. When he's come, he will tell us everything. He'll tell us all things. And Yeshua said to her, I that speak unto thee am he. People say he never said he was the Christ. He never said he was the Messiah. He just said it. So stop saying he never said it. He is. He's not a great prophet. He either is the Messiah or he's the biggest liar on the planet. So I hear Jewish people say, oh, he's, he's, he's a prophet. No. He's the Messiah of Israel because he said he's the Mashiach. Either he is the Messiah or he's a liar. Somebody say he's the Messiah. Did he tell us? Is he telling us all things? Are we warned? Are we being warned? Take heed. I mean, it... it if, if when the shofar and the trumpet blows and I see you foolish there, standing there on your blessed assurance and you don't get this, I'm going to be upset with you. I'm going to say, you didn't listen. You didn't pay attention. I mean, you missed the boat. How can you do that? You can't do, you can't come to the Mishkan and miss the boat. I'm here so you don't miss the boat. At least hear it. At least put it into practice. At least get ready. How many people say we're close to the return of the Lord? If we don't start this now, when are you going to start it? At the last minute, oh, the Lord's here. Oops, no oil. Give me some of yours, Donna. You're like, I, I, got, I got olive oil. You can't add you know. I'm Italian. I got Spanish oil. You got Italian oil, I got Spanish oil. Aceite. I had it the extra virgin. Aceite. Somebody say time to draw. Time to fill up. Time to get ready. Time to be a wise virgin. Time to get ready for the coming of the Lord. Time not to be caught without oil. Time to understand these things. Time to put him into practice. Because although Esther leads worship, she can't put the oil inside you. You've got to ask for it yourself. You have to know who it is. Who do I ask? Jesus. In his name. Yeshua. In his name. What are we asking for? I want more money. I want a newer car. I want an apartment. What are you asking for? Are you asking for oil? How I many know you can have a new car and everything else and be empty? In Jesus' name. And be in trouble. You could be a rich virgin and be spiritually empty. No oil. Unprepared. Are you with me? And it's a scary thought. Because this is going to happen to many people. Why are you saying this? Because many are, this is problems going to happen to many people. That's what the word of God says. And hopefully it won't happen to any of us. Thank you, Lord, for the Mishkan. Isaiah. One of my favorite scriptures. Isaiah chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 12, chapter 11, back up. Verse 16, let's look at the last verse in chapter 11. There shall be a highway for the remnant of his people that shall be left from Assyria as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Chapter 12, verse 1. And in that day you shall say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort us me. How many know that's another name for the Holy Spirit? The comforter. Is he angry with us? Somebody say he, his anger is turned away. Why? Because of his son. The punishment, the curse was on him. A lot of brothers and sisters still believe God is angry with them. His anger is turned away. He now comforts us. He's not looking at our, our shortcomings. He's not looking at our problems anymore. He wants us to look at him and the answers to get out of all these problems. He now comforts me. Verse 2, behold, God is my 
God is my Yeshua. God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my Yeshua. Jehovah has become my Jesus. Come on now, all you Jehovah Witnesses. All you sacred namers. I, I've said this to people. You cannot get the Holy Spirit in the name of Jehovah. I'm sorry. You can't be saved in the name of Jehovah. There's only one name under heaven where you can be saved. And you cannot get the Holy Spirit in the name of Jehovah. And you can't cast out demons in the name of Jehovah. And I'm not putting the name of Jehovah down. The name Jesus is the name above every name. Stop fooling around. And don't bring me that silly doctrine here. Oh, I get so upset. Because the devil knows. The, the 70 disciples came back and said, Lord, even the unclean spirits are subject unto us through Jehovah's name. The devil doesn't want us using the name of Jesus. Are you getting this? No, pray in the name of Mary. See if that works. See if you can get saved in the name of Mary. You can't. Oh, it's, it's, the, it's the mother of God. Great. I had a mom too. He, he said, anyone here born of a mother? We all did. I love my mom, but she's not my savior. The mother of God is not your savior. The mother of God can't save you. Read verse 2 again. Behold, God is my Yeshua, my salvation. I will trust, not be afraid, for the Lord, Yehovah, is my strength and my song. He also has become my Yeshua. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of Yeshua. With joy shall you draw. Somebody say, time to draw. If you don't draw, what's going to happen? You'll be dry. What happens if you're dry? Oh, I'm busy. I got other things to do. Yeah, be busy with other things to do. When the last shofar, the last trump blows, yeah, you're going to be busy, all right. You're going to be busy finding the door that's shut in your face. Are you saying that to put me down? No, I'm saying for you not to end up as a foolish virgin or a foolish person. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of Yeshua. And in that day, what day? Verse 4. In that day, when you're drawing, shall you say, praise the Lord. See, when you're drawing, you're filled with life. And I, I see brothers and sisters that are believers in the Lord and they're depressed. They're on antidepressants. I'm like, I, I don't get it. You ain't drawing, buddy. Or buddies. <laughs> buddy or buddy girl, whatever. You're not drawing. Because when you're drawing from Yeshua, from the wells of Yeshua, in his presence, King David said, his fullness of joy. You can't be depressed in God. It, you can't, it, it, in God, it says there's no sin. In Him is light. There's no sin in Him. You don't sin when you're in Him. When you're in the flesh, you sin. When you're in the flesh, you're empty. When you're in the flesh, you are, you're depressed. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation, out of the wells of Yeshua. And in that day, you will say, praise the Lord. Call upon His name. Declare his doings among the people. In other words, when you're drawing, you will say to other people, you need to call on the name of Yeshua, Jesus. You're not going to be a Jehovah witness. You're going to be a Jesus witness. Yay or nay. Yeshua said, you're my witnesses. When you're drawing, you'll know. And you will be a great evangelist. Because you'll be a happy evangelist. I've seen some of these miserable people talking about Jesus. If you're miserable, stop talking about Jesus. Talk about Jehovah. <laughs> Talk about Mary. I don't know. I mean, people can see if you're happy or you're miserable. Is, is, is the word gospel mean miserable? Or does the word gospel mean good news? 
When, when, when are you going to be in a good mood to preach the gospel? When you're drawing. And in that day, when you what? When you're drawing. You will say, praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his doings among the people. Make mention that his name is exalted. What did you do tonight, Gabriel? I exalted the name of Jesus. Why did you exalt the name of Yeshua? Because I like drawing. I remember a Wednesday night Bible study many years ago. I said, I'm a heavy drinker. And the lady came up to me afterwards. She goes, I didn't know you had a problem with alcohol. I said, silly woman. You think I was talking about alcohol? You think I was talking about the Holy Spirit? That's the best high from the most high. You want to compare that to alcohol? They did on Pentecost at 9 o'clock in the morning. They said, these people are drunk because they were so happy. They were drunk happy when the Holy Spirit hit them in Acts chapter 2. They said, these people are drunk. Peter said, it's 9 o'clock in the morning, guys. I, I don't see any bottles of whiskey here, do you? I don't see any wine here. You guys look too happy. You guys are like happy, happy. Somebody say, time to get happy, happy. And who? The Holy Spirit. Time to draw. Like I tell people, are you born again, believer? Oh, yes. Don't forget to tell your face. And in that day, you will say, praise the Lord. Verse 4. Call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. Where two or three are gathered in his name, he said, there am I in the midst of them. Hallelujah. Let's stand up and honor him, please. Oh, I'm excited when that chofar is going to blow. Somebody say, I'm ready, I'm ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready. I see a bunch of wise virgins here. I don't see any dumb ones. Any dumb virgin, please leave. No, stay and get, get with the program. Get with the oil. Stop buying. Start getting, start filling up. Somebody say, time to fill up. Hallelujah. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you. We're asking. We're seeking. We're knocking for the Holy Spirit. In the name above every name, the name Yeshua. Father God, fill every vessel here tonight to overflowing. Let rivers of living waters flow from our bellies, from each and every one of us. Let there not be one empty vessel tonight, one dry vessel, one foolish vessel. Father God, we are asking for the Holy Spirit, the name above every name, the name Yeshua, the name Jesus, the name Jesus. Even in Espanol, you can get the oil. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I'm asking, Lord. I'm knocking. I'm seeking. Father God, thank you that at the last trump, Father God, we have brothers, we have sisters, we have neighbors, we have relatives that have not called upon your name. Father God, draw them to yourself as you have done for each and every one of us. Let none of them perish. And every brother and sister from the sound of our voice, let there not be one foolish among us, Lord. We need to share this. Mention that his name is exalted. Mention that you can draw from the wells of Yeshua. Come on, brother. Come on, sister. Draw. Stop being miserable. Get happy in the Lord. More oil. Mas. Mucho mas. Say, I want more, Lord. Hallelujah. Fill yourself up and then ask for an overflow. Let the anointing touch other people. Father God, I want to be like Peter. 
that when I walk by people, my shadow will touch them. Father God, let your anointing flow in this life, in this person, rivers of living waters. Let me speak less and show more, Lord. Your joy, your light in my face. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Father God, we thank you that in your presence is fullness of joy that at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And Father God, fill us with your oil. Invade every bit of darkness, every corner of emptiness in our life with your anointing, with your Holy Spirit. In the name above every name, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, in his name we pray. The world calls him Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen, amen, Shabbat Shalom. Give the Lord a big hand, please. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching on the internet. We're going to close in worship. How about a little more oil? Somebody say, I want a little more oil. You can never get enough. We're going to close in worship and then the bedtime Shema. Stay and eat some. Do we have some food? We do. Amazing. Oh, Lord God of There is no God like thee in the heavens. There is no God like thee in the earth. O Lord God of just want to encourage you to stay break bread with one another encourage each other to love and good works um, we were we are going to be here tomorrow morning at 11 a.m because shabbat continues it is a 24-hour experience please don't miss out on that uh amazing experience and the privilege of fellowshipping with our heavenly father on his holy day that's an extraordinary privilege uh, and it came at a price messiah yeshua laid down his life so that we could enjoy this privilege don't take it for granted um, thank you to all of you who support this ministry with ties with love offerings with the work of your hands with the love in your heart with your prayers thank you so much thank you thank you thank you we really really appreciate your support thank you for your obedience and um, i just want to wish you all a shabbat shalom we're going to say the bedtime shema we want to make sure that our hearts are in the right place so we can go to sleep with a clean conscience so that our prayers will not be hindered. Rather, they will rise up as a fragrant incense to the throne of grace, okay? So follow me, sovereign of the universe. Before I sleep, I forgive all who have angered me, upset, or sinned against my honor, body, work, or all that's mine. Whether willful, careless, accidental, purposeful, or through their speech, by word or by deed in this world or other worlds, let no one be punished for my wrong. May it be your will I not sin again towards you, that I may not do wrong in your sight. May any wrongs I've done be erased in your great mercy, not through any punishment or pain. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable before you, my Redeemer and my Rock. 
שמה ישראל אדוני אלוהינו, אדוני אחד, ברוך שם כבוד מלכותו לעולם ועד. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever and ever. God bless you all. Shabbat shalom. Laila tov. We'll see you in the morning.